and uh, wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, to, we're really excited to talk about promoting social, emotional, and behavioral learning in schools today. Will we, <clears throat> excuse me. I am uh, Ken Radiola. I'm the Mental Health Distinguished Educator for the Maine Department of Education. And uh, I'll introduce the rest of our co-hosts and our presenter today. Our co-hosts are Susan Berry, the Health Education and Health Promotion Specialist at DOE, and Tammy Diaz, a school nurse specialist. And we're incredibly lucky today to have Sarah Nelson with us. Um, Sarah is the Student Engagement Consultant with the Maine Department of Education, um, and um, far, far smarter than I am. Uh, as usual, we'll also review the mission and vision of the Maine Department of Education. It is the mission and vision of the Maine Department of Education to, to promote the best learning opportunities for all Maine students by providing information, guidance, and support to our schools, educators, and leaders, and by providing adequate and equitable school funding and resources. And then our session overview for today, We'll quickly review the format for today's session. We'll review the strategy of promoting social, emotional, and behavioral learning. We'll participate in small group discussions focused on the strategy, and we'll engage in report outs from our breakout activity. And then we'll give a, a brief summary of what to expect in next week's webinar. As a reminder, there's an understanding that schools will be in different places regarding the implementation of the strategy. We respect the position of every school and are proud to provide this opportunity to learn and discuss the ideas of growing your readiness to fully implement the strategy. As we begin, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and we'll respond to these questions at the end of the presentation or in the summary that is distributed following the presentation. We'll be dropping the link in the chat for the Promoting Mental Health and Wellbeing in Schools and Action Guide for School and District Leaders. And then our creating safe space for collaboration. We value the experiences that each of you and your school, <clears throat> excuse me, we value the experiences that each of you, your schools and your communities bring to this webinar. This is a safe space to come together, discuss and share experiences and ideas and knowledge. This is meant to be an interactive and engaging experience. So we have a few norms to create a safe space for collaboration. Um, we're going to assume positive intent. We're going to share the air. I'm hopeful that everybody will, will feel comfortable contributing gems that can help the group learn. And we'll all be focused on learning and teaching. And just as a reminder, these nor group norms apply to all sessions. And now you, we're all... I'm very lucky to have Sarah Nelson. Well, good afternoon, guys. <clears throat> Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that uh, the weather in your neck of the woods is a little bit sweeter than it is here where I am. Um, but it it um, it's promise of better things coming down the road. Lots of flowers getting ready to pop. So. Thank you for joining us again. Um, I <clears throat> can introduce me very briefly. And thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. Um, one of the things I will tell you is I have been a classroom educator for 32 years. Um, and I just recently stepped out of the classroom into my role at the Department of Education. The reason I'm here today uh, to speak with you is to share a little bit about the opportunities that there are to explore social, emotional, and behavioral learning and uh, what it is. I learned over my three decades in the classroom that I needed specific skill sets to try to help uh, students reach their optimal learning. And uh, this was the package that really worked for me. So when we think about social, emotional, and behavioral learning, uh, what is it? Well, we think about the focus on developing skills that promote physical and mental health and resilience. Uh, within that, there are typically five different basic competencies that they are categorized um, into. One would be self-management. That is when we're looking at students' ability to manage their emotions, really be aware of their thoughts, and uh, their be manage their behaviors in different situations. 
Another uh, competency would be in the area of responsible decision making. Thinking again about students' ability to make caring and positive choices about their behaviors and the social interactions that they are engaged in within the school setting. Relationship skills would be another area that we would focus on. That's the student's ability to build and maintain those healthy and supportive relationships and to also positively interact with diverse people. Um, thinking about groups, supporting student growth and connections, making those connections with uh, peers and with um, educators in the school setting. Social awareness is a fourth area that SEL focuses on. That's the student's ability to understand the views of others and to really empathize, really thinking about how other people in their uh, realm might perceive something or interpret something. And the last one that's stated here is self-awareness. And self-awareness really truly is the foundation of all SEL. And that is a student's ability to understand their own emotions, understand their own thoughts, their values, and how they affect um, their own behavior. And with this, this is, this is the foundation of all SEL. From there, you can jump into being able to be a little bit more self-managed. Sometimes we say, I don't understand why Tommy isn't behaving. Well, it might also be because he's just not even aware. So self-awareness, then typically we move to self-management. From there, social awareness, going into relationship skills, and then finally the skill of responsible decision-making. So when we think about this in a school setting, there really are two different approaches to helping students gain this understanding. Um, the CDC offers two approaches for nurturing social and emotional behavioral skills. And these are, <clears throat> excuse me, the first would be providing classroom-based instruction, which focuses on building the social skills and offering emotional development as well. At, and that would be, this would be like your tier one level. And that would impact about 80% of the classroom. You should anticipate being able to um, clearly reach. And at the tier one level for classroom instruction, that's where you really provide instruction for all of your students. The second uh, approach to SEL is when you would use data to help uh, target specific students that um, need additional support. That would be a tier two level. And that would be um, addressing about 15% of a typical typical population, you might have a smaller group approach to that and have targeted education that focuses on skills that they might be um, not yet um, up to up to par with. So that would be for social skills and emotional development, but in a small group setting. So I'm going to start first with what does this classroom instruction look like? As I said, this is where all of the students um, receive instruction. Approximately 80% um, are really, really gonna benefit from in-class um, classroom instruction. Some of the topics that might be explored at, the, at this um, level would be recognizing your thoughts. Again, that's that self-awareness. What am I thinking? Where am I feeling it? How am I feeling? How is this impacting me? You might also, again, make the, the leap to understanding your feelings. When I feel this way, oh, do I have control over it? What can I do that might help me be a little bit more ready for learning? Making decisions and problem solving. Again, that's the connectedness piece and um, really helping students understand the importance of how do you make a good decision and how can you be a part of a team that is problem solving? Again, that all feeds into having the healthy relationships. Again, you need to have that um, ability to empathize and understand different perspectives. When you're in the classroom, instruction can take a, a series of different formats. Some schools use a computer-based program. Um, each school needs to decide what works for them, what they have resources for uh, that are available. But again, it might be a, a computer-based programming. It might be programming that would be uh, part of a guidance program, maybe a guidance, a school counselor might come into a classroom and provide this instruction, or perhaps 
Um, it might be something where classroom educators, there are different programs that are designed specifically for classroom teachers, and that might be like a weekly different topic, and um, they might be able to present that. Each school needs to make the determination of what works well, but again, at the classroom level, this is designed to really reach all students in the classroom. Then, as a result of um, assessments that your team decides on, you would be able to tease out data that would give you really, really important information. Perhaps there are small groups of students that would really benefit from a little bit of focused instruction. Again, this would be students who need some additional support, maybe for emotional or behavioral challenges by using assessment tools and by looking at the data, then you can really tailor your targeted instruction to meet the needs, um, the identified needs that will support these students. Again, this would be about the 15% of your classroom that might need a tier two approach. With any programming that happens in a school, anytime you're looking at uh, presenting curriculum or new programming, it's really important that we think about the importance of focusing on equity. We need to maybe consider using transformative social and emotional learning to advance the equity that we're talking about here. This is an opportunity for us to understand and address inequities that students might be experiencing. For example, when we think about transformative programs, um, it, we, we could think about the opportunity that youth could be given. What if they could take a look at their own community that they are a member of and look at something that they perceive as an, in, in, uh, um, an area of inequity? Then as a team, the students could come together and develop solutions. It's the focus of identity, belonging, that collaborative problem solving um, that really is built on curiosity. When we think about considering these screening tools, it's super, super important that as a team, you take a look at possible bias or maybe misuse of the assessment tools. This is where we think about the systemic errors that might sometimes occur in measuring, in the measuring process. Sometimes we unintentionally um, overlook different challenges that would um, influence a student's success based on maybe a, a, an identified group. When you're looking at the bias, time it, it's an opportunity for you to create a very clear plan uh, for using data. It's an opportunity to ensure that your school has a follow-up plan and that um, your follow-up plan is based on the responses as you assess how students are progressing through the program, then maybe you need to really look at it and make some, some uh, changes, some, some improvement. It's an opportunity to look at systemic implementation. Also, another opportunity here to make sure that all of your staff members, not just a classroom teacher, but all of your staff has the uh, data so that they can be an integral part of furthering the programming. So when it comes down to implementation, school leaders are a key, play a, a real key role in this. And when I talk about it, it could be the administration, but it could also be school leaders on different uh, implementation teams. This is where we, we realize the fact that change does not come until adults change their behaviors or really focus their resources, thinking about, okay, what is it that we really, really wanna have occur here? And then really thinking about some strategic planning. What is our budgeting gonna look like? It's funny, somebody once said, I can tell you instantly where a district's priorities lie just by looking at their budgeting. Financial budgeting, budgeting of resources, budgeting of time. So how, as a district leader, can you bring this forward? Um, these are all things that are really an integral part of getting a social, emotional, learning, and behavioral program going. It does require time. It does require financing. Um, 
So it's 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 an opportunity to embed when, when you've decided what you want to do. How can educators maybe embed things in scheduling, embed things in their their routines? And um, it's it's a very it, it's a this is where the planning comes in. And by creating a super clear plan that everyone has had an opportunity to have input in, that's where you're going to find your sweet spot and you'll have your greatest success. So at this time, I'm going to, I'd like to turn things over to Susan Berry, who is going to uh, present a few discussion prompts and kind of set the stage for the next portion of our webinar. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for a wonderful presentation. So we are going to go into breakout rooms now. Um, I've just got them set up, so approximately five or six people per breakout room. And then we will not be recording during that time. When we come back, we'll record the report out. And we have three um, questions here or prompts here that just to help get your discussion going in your breakout. How is your school or district addressing classroom-based instruction focused on building? Back one up for me there, Ken, or Tammy. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> there we are, thank you. <laughs> on building social skills and emotional development. And where and when is this offered during the school date? So who, not only who delivers it, but where in the schedule does it fit, um, that sort of thing. Then how does your school district make time for that targeted education that Sarah talked about um, in the small groups or, and or individualized time? And also in the discussion, what is the evidence that you see that shows that this is beneficial and or what are some challenges that have needed to be addressed that you come up, um, up against?